Good afternoon, friends. It is my honor to moderate this valuable session on a very, very relevant topic, harnessing the potential of edge computing. I don't think any other technology creates as much interest or has as much application in the industry in the near foreseeable future as much as edge computing does. And possibly it is the one technology about which we don't know enough as well or we don't talk about it enough. So thank you, Strategic, for picking up this topic and making it contextual and relevant to the audience here. Uh, I have a very esteemed panel with me. Uh, and uh, I think we will straight away get into the discussion. While uh, the market size for edge computing, I mean, I was trying to get some data points on what is the market size for edge computing looking like. And we were discussing it's very difficult to get those numbers because it's such a mix of hardware and software and IoT pieces mixed together. Uh, it's really uh, ambiguous, the numbers. On which side you look at, you have a different number. All we can arrive at a conclusion is, I believe it was somewhere around 43 uh, billion USD in 2023, expected to be around 81 billion by 2027. And I, I assume it is anybody's guess how these numbers are going to go and how the ad adoption is going to pan out. So let's start with the understanding of the context and the usage in your organizations. Uh, what is the state? Would you like to talk about uh, what are the use cases that you're seeing in your organizations? So, Parna, could you start off, please? Hello. Hello. <coughs> so, uh, good evening, all of you, and thanks to Strategying for inviting us uh, for this. I think that it's one of the difficult topics, you know, because it's an evolving market, and uh, age computing, I believe, like cloud 10 years back was... Uh, kind of a buzzword today like cloud is one of the de facto standards for you know hosting applications and infrastructure tomorrow edge computing also become will become something like that although the figures looks very astonishing 135 billion dollar or something but <clears throat> if you look at indian market and especially automotive and manufacturing market it is uh, slowly picking up so i will start with a different note you know uh, it's kind of a uh, to some extent, a packaging of the old concept of traditional in-house hardware uh, facilities or you know capabilities in a new form or shape with new capabilities. So, like we, you have the AI and other contents you know available for edge computing, but otherwise it's basically in-room computing or in-house computing or on-premise computing. Whatever you s we said a few years back, it's actually coming in a different shape to all of us again. So the use cases, if you look at especially for the factories of tomorrow or the smart factories. One important factor is uh, real-time uh, on-mobile uh, analytics, especially for the mid-management who takes the tactical decisions. Like example, certain raw materials are not available right now. We need to ship the, uh, you know, the finished goods or something like that. Or even in case of some supplier delivery issues or something, how to change the production schedule, the line uh, ef ef efficiency is not coming up, how to do the changing change in the, the layouts or something like that. So this kind of real-time decision-making is actually possible, and we are in a pilot phase of uh, taking up certain areas uh, of that. Uh, this is one of the use cases I have seen. And second is... Uh, you know, lot of organizations are looki looking at large-scale shop floor digitization. When I say shop floor digitization, it's not a new thing, but it's happening for many, many years. But now it's happening more, uh, especially after the COVID. Uh, most of the organizations are looking at wide-scale uh, shop floor digitization, paperless factories, smart uh, factories, and even IoT and other stuff which are already there in the factories, especially for OEE, for maintenance, for safety, for quality, and other stuff. So this area is getting dis disrupted through this edge computing, uh, you know, device and as well as application, as he rightly mentioned. So uh, one is availability of mobile, and the, the the 5G network is getting stronger. Second is the private 5G is also coming up from all the service providers, and third is the analytics and application getting democratized for the users and real-time analytics happening on the mobile. It's not a back-end thing which is happening, processing data 
and taking a lot of time. It's taking out the data and doing real-time analytics and providing the insights to the, uh, the workflow managers. I think this is the very good use case currently happening and investments are not that great. Payback and ROI or even the KPIs can be achieved in a very, very fast manner. So I think pilots are going on in many, many organizations, especially automotive, non-automotive, some process or uh, industry industries, certain pilots are going on. I think the success rates will be coming up in days to come. Thank you for that, Parna. I think some of the interesting use cases are around vision AI, which have been very old use cases. So maybe if uh, one of you, maybe Nitin, if you could amplify a bit more on some use cases. Thanks, thanks, Annie, and thanks, Strategy Team, for calling me here. It's a privilege to be here in front of all of you. Uh, I represent the manufacturing sector. My past experience in the present organization, we have been doing a lot on edge side at the shop floor level, like Parna did briefly mention. Uh, for us, the edge, you know, basically edge what it means, it basically means uh, processing the data close to the source. And for us, the source is the machines uh, which are generating a lot of data. Uh, there are inherent challenges also uh, in terms of connectivity and other aspects because of which we use edge. And then there are operational efficiencies, uh, as well as uh, cost for which we use. Some of the predominant use cases, we have automated one of our entire uh, manufacturing unit uh, at uh, Kehrani and this is for the faucet manufacturing. So people were generating data and uh, the machine's data was logged in a logbook. Now through sensors, this data is getting into the system and the visualization of like what Parna also mentioned, line efficiency, equipment efficiency, all of that is done uh, locally at the site. All of it uses edge computing because that uh, data cannot be sent to cloud and processed. It is done locally at the system. Uh, latencies and uh, many other aspects are there because of which it is done. Uh, you also, Annie, just mentioned about the vision. So we are also doing uh, pilots around computer visions for defect analysis using edge. Uh, our models are trained uh, so that the SKU name is identified using uh, pre-trained models and uh, as soon as the product comes on a line, uh, there is a computer vision which detects this program is trained on edge and if there are quality defects which are found on product, then immediately uh, the uh, upward system is updated with these logs. Then a lot of analytics is done at the back end. Suppose there are exceptions, a machine temperature has gone up. Such kind of exceptions are logged to cloud and some analytics models are built for predictive maintenance. But once they are built, then the firmware over the, of the gateways are updated and the local system tells about the predictive maintenance uh, alarms. So this is also done on edge side. Uh, this was on the shop floor side and we are also doing a lot on the air, water, electricity, consumption uh, and those are all, all generated, the data is all generated and locally analyzed using edge. In terms of product, uh, we, we are also manufacturing kitchen products. So one of the product that we manufacture is uh, chimney. So we, we kind of take pride in sharing that we, sh we created the world's first IoT chimney. Now, uh, for the customer experience, uh, while you are using chimney, your hands could be uh, dirty or it would be unhygienic to touch chimney while you are cooking. So by wave of hand, the chimney can be switched on or switched off. This intelligence is also built using edge. And uh, while in, not in my present stint, but in past, I have done on the connected vehicle, electric vehicle. So the telematics which fits in the vehicle was also having intelligence of edge. So these are few cases. Thanks. In fact, one of the use cases which you mentioned about a, a passenger or a rider uh, falling and an immediate alarm being transmitted, uh, assessing. I thought that was a very interesting use yeah, case and yeah. not a very common use case. Correct. Uh, so if you want, I can spend 30 yes, sure. seconds on that. Thanks. So if, if let's say uh, uh, you are riding a vehicle and all of a sudden, let's say an accident uh, should not happen to anyone, but if imagine the accident happens, then there is an algorithm which detects the accident and immediately your near and dear ones gets an alert. If this computing is done on cloud, 
vehicle sending the message and cloud computing it and just imagine you not being in a place or a vicinity where uh, internet connectivity is there then such alerts may not go and second could be a theft alert so if if a person has stolen the vehicle and you want to switch it off uh, remotely or immobilize it from a remote location then again the intelligence has to be built on the edge close to the system which can be operated from a far off location so this all also requires a lot of edge intelligence and yeah in my past things i have done this thank you uh, atul uh, from a process from a appliance and uh, auto industry we move to a process industry what would you say hello but i could i could hear you i'm not sure whether others have been able to hear you i think what your point was we've spoken about appliances so let's talk about process industries that's what annie that's right that's yeah, right good so thank you for having me and uh, th thanks strategic team uh, team to have us all together so i think uh, what i'll in the next couple of minutes i'll highlight what we have done in india glycol so i work for india glycol though the name suggests that no we have we make chemicals or some pharma products but we got five six divisions and i'll talk about one division which may of be of interest to many of you it's the liquor division which we have and in our liquor division no what we do is there are these bottles which get which have to be packed so you bottle them seal them label them and then they move through the value stream on a conveyor belt assume and the speed is such that no every and we've got such 25 plus odd lines or 25 plus lines which are there making imfl and cl and in each line uh, the speed would vary between uh, roughly around 220 cases to 500 cases per hour per hour when i say so one case may have 40 odd bottles or 24 odd bottles depending on the size of the sku so what we did is uh, and this was a classic case wherein we created an aggregation that based on the qr code which is placed on the bottle cap there is a qr code we do an aggregation of those say 45 qr codes which are kept in that physical case and then uh, the system which is the system which is there the scanning machine which is there it scans those 45 odd bottles which are placed in the case and then uh, basically puts the qr the barcode on the case the case uh, barcode gets aggregated and it pl places it there so that the through the entire uh, journey while it goes to the distribution to the retailers the entire journey can be you can track that particular bottle also and also that case what time of the day which line it got produced packed all of that happens and now while we we are doing so there is another from because excise liquor is an excise subject state excise subject so now there is a requirement that no we do some part of this compute here and some part will be done in in a portal which they are provisioning the excise team is provisioning through a third party so what is happening today is now the data has to go out from the aggregated data of this 45 cases data has to go to the cloud and from there we get the the barcode from uh, back to to uh, for us to print now you can well imagine that now we are talking about in one in 5 seconds we are producing one case so the data going outside coming and then you do to create that barcode so we are doing it now when we have tested it we have done it now but these are classic cases and you could always do it manually some old old uh, such production units they are doing it manually on, uh, on the shop floor but we have chosen to do it uh, through digital means that's one and secondly on uh, our electricity consumption for one of our plants in kashipur we have set up a complete iot case wherein all the high energy generating and consuming units be it dg sets turbines or uh, motors ht motors lt motors of higher capacities all of that data of electricity consumption and not just electricity in terms of wattage but also in terms of the current imbalance voltage imbalance whatever is data is there which is relevant to monitor not just the performance but also from a maintenance standpoint that no if there could be certain aspects which can predict that no if there is such an imbalance then combination of such data points may result into a malfunction so we get a predictive kind of an assessment which we can act on so likewise like parna you mentioned around the whole iot thing so we created a smart factory setup wherein 
data points from various control rooms which are there in the plant we we aggregated and control systems from Yokogawa, Emerson, Rockwell, Allen Bradley it used to be earlier, Honeywell, Siemens, all of them no disparate, it's almost like a zoo I would say and wherein we, whilst we were setting it up it was interoperability, it was a great challenge and we could see it, uh, we, we hear it in forums but we could actually face it and we using uh, Kepware which is now PTC, uh, we used the OPC interconnect to basically interface all of these disparate systems and got data out of, and while we were taking data out of the systems, we had to be very careful that what do we do in the on the edge and what do we take on the cloud because this data also had batch cycle data, batch recipe data. So we had to be very uh, careful that you know what goes out and we uh, we should be clearly aware and what should be uh, available for decision support within the premise. So that's the whole premise, uh, Annie. If I been able to answer it. So we have heard from a variety of industries. In fact, I was hoping uh, there would be a temperature sensitive or a cold chain focused uh, company also. Like I used to work with Mother Dairy and one of our challenges used to be managing temperature yeah. and logically edge is a use case uh, for any temperature aberration detection uh, kind of use cases where it doesn't make sense to throw out every temperature data back to the cloud or, or to a central uh, ecosystem, but only the aberrations need to be acted upon kind of thing. So those are some of the standard use cases which is under widespread adoption. Uh, uh, Carl, from a product vendor perspective, any insights that you would like to share? Yeah, so my, I think our organization uses AI a little different for most of the manufacturing companies because we focus on software and seeing how software developers can essentially uh, get the best out of their products. Um, Atlassian has uh, uh, something called AI Assist, which essentially helps, uh, it's, uh, I, let me talk about two use cases, one internal and the next one. So internally, we use uh, AI, uh, something called, uh, that's, that's, since we're an Australian company, it's called Mate, or AI Mate, uh, Good Day Mate, that's what we're popularly known for. And uh, this essentially works across Jira software, uh, for natural language and for uh, JQ JQL and C SQL uh, queries. Uh, we've also got the same tool which uh, looks at summaries, uh, either across, uh, uh, across Confluence, which is a tool that's very popularly used by everyone. It, if you look, it looks at the entire page and gives you a summary of what's, what's on that in probably five or six sentences. And for someone who's new, who's joined an organization, uh, there are a lot of acronyms that are there internal to an organization when you're 10 plus 20 years old. Uh, you know, acronyms which no one else uses, like we use something called Socrates for our data lake. So when new people join us, uh, the AI mate helps them understand how we use acronyms. Uh, for the salespeople, uh, it goes into, it looks at financial data and gives you a summary of how, uh, the simplest way of looking at how to approach a customer. The same thing we do also do for our external customers. Uh, there it's called uh, Atlassian Assistant. So when the software developers need help with their uh, queries, it, it comes and helps them with that. Uh, when it comes to looking at tickets and resolving tickets that don't really need uh, human interference, that's something that the, the assist can do for a lot of us. And uh, summaries is something that is internal as well as external. So that has been a biggest challenge for a lot of our customers where uh, they've seen uh, confluence pages with loads and loads of data where nobody's going to have the time to read all of it. So uh, assist comes in and just summarizes everything in five to ten uh, sentences and you can ask it further questions to streamline your questions. Thank you. Thank you for that, Carl. Uh, coming to the, I mean, what is it in it? I, I think everything finally boils down to uh, where are you seeing the benefits of the uh, technology being deployed? Is it uh, purely a latency or a speed benefit that you're seeing? Are there economies, uh, uh, cost economies available? Uh, how, how do you see uh, 5G and Edge uh, evolve? Do you see that uh, uh, one become, makes the other redundant or do you see them coexisting? So a bit of crystal gazing. I mean, and to me, uh, how much of Edge computing is actually uh, make, I mean, how much of automation is actually dependent on edge? So some of these aspects, if you could bring them in, Nitin, I think, uh, over to you. Thanks, thanks, Annie. Uh, <coughs> see, 
there is not one dimension which edge solves. There are multiple dimensions. Some of you, you also mentioned, uh, let's go one by one. Uh, in a manufacturing setup use case, it's the operational efficiency, A, that uh, so gets resolved. So in our case, when we were doing the computations of TCOs, we found that edge was saving 60% approximately the cost for us because every data was not supposed to be sent to cloud and processed and then visualizations happen. We did that locally uh, through the IoT games and the cap fairs and OPC UA servers, everything. Uh, then uh, second uh, is the experience. Like I took an example of chimney. Now beyond experience, uh, nothing great happens here. But experience comes because of the edge. Now you cannot send every information of gesture control to cloud and from there you do the processing back. So experience is the second element that it brings in. And at times it's absolute utility which is done only through edge. Uh, no other tool can support you. Uh, for example, like a theft alert. Now uh, a th when, when, when you hear that your vehicle is stolen, uh, what the immediate action a person will take is to immobilize the vehicle. The cloud can process and give you the message about the theft alert and you give an action to immobilize the vehicle. Now immobilization happens through edge. So it's an absolute utility and uh, you know, in this Chandrayaan we heard that there is plan B, plan C for the course correction of the trajectory which is processed. So firmwares were built and everything was processed at the edge side and the action would be taken at the edge side. So edge solves multiple dimensions, that is one. Now what you mentioned about 5G and edge, I believe both the technologies are complementing each other. There is no standout that edge will uh, take away or 5G will take away because uh, while uh, the data generation at speed happens from technologies like 5G, processing of that would require the edge to be there. And again, I'll go back to this connected vehicle example. Suppose you have a, a two-wheeler and it's giving uh, a packets of message every two or three seconds. Uh, this may happen because of 5G that you get all these speed, connectivity and other things. Uh, take and, uh, and then if there is a bi-directional action to be taken like immobilization of vehicle or an alert being sent from the vehicle to the system about to uh, happening to the vehicle or uh, uh, accident alerts, uh, no, this would require edge to be intelligent. And then there are things like firmware over the air wherein you make the edge more and more intelligent either from the security perspective or from the behavioral perspective. So this is just my two cents. Atul. Anything to add? I think uh, one, uh, you've covered mo most of the points, Nitin, but I think there's another aspect around data governance also because you, one needs to also figure out what data can reside within or should reside within the enterprise premises. So I call it rusty but trusty, uh, your, uh, the whole uh, system servers which you set up you know, in your backhaul. So so that's, that's one part because that will, I'm, I'm not uh, not in the foreseeable f future. I see they'll they'll go off, but what I also want to refer you were talking about certain numbers. So I was r going through this Gartner report, which mentions that by end of 25, 26, perhaps start of 26, we might as well see a situation wherein almost 75 percent of the data or the compute also related to the data would neither be residing on these data centers, rusty but trusty data centers, on-prem, or the cloud which we've been talking about, which, which is a very different paradigm. It challenges all our whatever current uh, thoughts are, because we believe either we are on-prem or we are on the cloud, private or otherwise, public. But this, it says that no, and edge is, is the focus, wherein a lot of these computes and a lot of these processing storage of data would start happening on these uh, so-called IoT or such devices. No, so that's the uh, uh, that's a very different. Sorry, that's a very different theme. But uh, I believe so because more and more we are seeing smarter devices. We earlier had dumb sensors which were just transmitting data. 
but now we got smart sensors which can also do some part of the compute and maybe also do an m to m machine to machine interface as we progress yeah uh, rohit you have been very quiet till now uh, so the perspective uh, i think your perspective would be very valuable a law from a uh, law firm or sort of the legal angle what are the uh, impacts of security and privacy concern uh, how do we ensure security of data at the edge so would you be able to bring in those perspectives to this discussion sure thank you uh, so so before getting on the security aspect i actually wanted to add to the previous conversation on the use cases uh, see a lot of us are talking about chat gpt open ai and some of those stuff in a law firm what we did was we got the modern train through open ai but we used our data and we are kind of fine tuning that a lot of you might be doing something like that a local enterprise wide chat gpt kind of a solution right this in a way is a edge because the processing and most of the data is residing inside and the training is happening from open ai enterprise uh, apis and all and perhaps for some of the startup people who are there i was when i was making this solution within my firm you were thinking why can't a startup come out with a solution like that it's could be edge as a service or something like that where the modern is trained on uh, the large language model and you take your data and provide a solution there perhaps a lot of firms like us would be interested in a solution like that because in a law firm as you said security of data compliance and some of these things are very important because we are custodian of the data of our client and that is where everything comes down to security now with edge what happens is we understand that in edge it's about the devices moving away from local to somewhere as you said rusty but but crusty kind of a way which means the physical security of the devices itself is something which have to be thought about by physical security it can mean from a pure somebody stealing away that server to getting unauthorized access to those devices or you know what lot of communication as you said is 5g and all interception of that that is possible possible there so so whenever we are talking about that some of these aspects come to mind definitely from that angle uh, apart from that definitely authorization and uh, control of those devices how do we ensure that only authorized persons are having access despite we not having a very real physical control the way we would like with a cloud kind of a device so those are some aspects which definitely comes to mind Uh, i was talking to a person in uh, aws and the aws is coming out with a edge kind of a solution offering and one of the offering was uh, as devices in uh, remote uh, northeastern area and where these devices are there and then they are talking to the central server and aws servers can be accessed from there sounds like a simple solution but the biggest hitch was the you know the physical security of those devices biggest of the risk were lying so these are certain things i can think of from a security and a security perspective and definitely with the new data protection act coming the digital data protection act uh, the 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 data the the ownership of data is with the firm and and there is a lot of penalty involved in case the data gets stolen so some of those aspects also from the way the the uh, infrastructure is changing the way the legal uh, uh, landscape is changing some of those things also have to be taken when we do a risk and benefit analysis of these devices since most of the use case cases which we have been hearing about seems to be around edge ai kind of solutions uh, i anyone else wants to act uh, add to the point of security how would uh, how are you ensuring security or access control uh, restrictions to your devices which are on the edge today i think that's a very tricky question actually you brought a very valid point because once you have so if you have single neck to catch so it could be the data center setup or the cloud thing wherein you got dumb sensors and you got connectivity and everything gets processed on the cloud so you've got you have a, a smaller battle to fight but when you have these intelligent devices which are you know all over the place you know you got thousands of them how do you patch them how do you make sure that they are secure enough from access 
and uh, from a cyber security standpoint also data leakage prevention standpoint you, there are vulnerabilities which exist but today the state is you no know, you there you need to take have a trade off between performance outcomes vis a vis uh, taking a posture that no i'll be secure but not be doing anything it's like you 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 can be far secure if you're shut in the home not moving out but then you don't earn anything so no risk no gain but i think we would be reaching to a stage wherein there would be standards which would be in place there are standards like i spoke about opc like you got mqtt as a protocol which is uh, which has evolved over the years so and they would progressively become far more secure than what they currently are so it's it's security of course is a big problem but it cannot be uh, an umbrella under which we will shy off and I driving think innovations of yeah and i think some of the zero trust architectures also help as long as you're able to address the physical security the only thing is when you are talking about so many of these disparate edge devices then having that uh, view that no one having that inventory itself of what needs to be patched how often true, true. and uh, who is having access at what point of time bringing that intelligence on a dashboard that itself will take a while to mature i would say I, I think the single pain manageability dream which all of us live with kind of thing. Uh, uh, Carl, coming to you, since major, one of the major use case again uh, seems to be AI and uh, uh, edge with AI kind of solutions, how are product companies like Atlassian deploying the tools for AI? So what I would like to say about, I mean, of course we don't look at edge, edge products, it's more about products that uh, we build products that you, uh, you or as customers would end up using. Uh, what, so a lot of times people look to us to see how do we go forward. Um, we, are, we are one of the pioneers when it comes to AI and how Microsoft, uh, for example, OpenAI, everybody has a different way of looking at things. So uh, Atlassian, when they decided to come out with AI products, they said, let's not do it only for ourselves, let's, let's see how other, uh, other companies can also build their own AI tools. Uh, so Atlassian built our AI on, on certain principles, similar to what Microsoft OpenAI does for itself. Uh, we've got uh, the Atlassian technology principles uh, based on which we built and are continuing to build our AI products. And we said, uh, this is not enough just for us to consume. Let's get it out there for everyone else to consume as well. So when other companies are going out and building AI products for themselves internally, uh, it's a good roadmap to get from where they are to building their own AI products or when using other companies or absorbing other companies' functionality when it comes to AI. So we've, we've got something called the uh, technology principle template, uh, which we've now publicly launched on our website for any customer to use if he's looking at building AI tools or consuming AI from different companies. This is about a 27, 28 pager uh, template that is out publicly, which helps anyone who wants to uh, understand AI and see whether it's a fit for his organization and how to consume it. You answer these questions, it gives you a fair view of how, where you are right now and where you can be when you use AI tools. Uh, as uh, Werner Vogel's uh, Amazon CTO articulated the three laws of uh, uh, edge computing, the laws of physics, the laws of economics, and the laws of the land. The laws of speed uh, or physics is a law of speed or latency that you need faster turnaround, you need uh, one millisecond kind of turnaround uh, reactions, and hence the uh, edge computing solutions come into picture. Laws of economics, you don't want all data to go on to the cloud your bandwidth optimization becomes essential uh, and the law of the land, uh, the uh, data residency requirements where they stem from. I heard a fourth one which said that if uh, synchronicity of the communication uh, across the devices, if two robots are uh, acting or uh, uh, doing act tasks, how do you ensure that they are synchronized and acting uniformly and not at differentiated time periods? So I believe we have heard all those use cases articulated, and to me, imitation is the best form of flattery. Uh, live examples of how CIOs are and CDOs are deploying these uh, make the best way to bring in new technology adoption into different organizations. So as a concluding question, uh, what would are the challenges 
that you would like to outline for CIOs or CISOs who are considering adoption right now? Uh, what do they need to factor in for scalability? Uh, especially in the context of AI and IoT, how do you see this uh, hybrid architecture span out? So, uh, Parna, would you like to step in? Yeah. <clears throat> I think, you know, there will be challenges always, but like cloud, if you look at cloud, uh, we were discussing 10 years back and then suddenly during COVID, you know, the, the, the way cloud picked up and today I think every company is there in cloud. Even uh, our company, if you see, we're 100% on cloud except our the plant data center, so which we have not still now, you know, went into cloud. So similarly for edge computing, there will be challenges coming up, whether it is security or privacy or even uh, use cases or, you know, the, the, the KPIs, achieving the KPIs or stuff like that. But I think the, the, the crux of the story is, first you need to make a strategy, whether you want to go for a monolithic architecture or a hybrid architecture, edge plus cloud. This first is, this thing is very, to be very important. Second thing is, you need to have a roadmap. What you want to do first, because there has to be some certain prioritization. Organizations like us who have 70 plus plants across the globe and then prioritization becomes extremely important. What do you do, want to do first and what do you want to achieve uh, next? After doing that, you need to start small, smaller pilots, fail early, learn very quickly, and then you know take the countermeasures and deploy fast. So I think this strategy we are following across followed by obviously you know measuring the kpis whatever we have decided in the beginning whether we are able to achieve or not lastly make a presentation to the management get more funds obviously if the kpis are getting achieved then you get more funds for deployments your team gets excited and you also encourage your teams to fail many people what happens is do not take risks because of failures apprehension of failure so i think that apprehension has to be wiped off from your mind and we might fail or we, we might succeed but doesn't matter we need to try something on in our hands because it has enormous capability in again i'm coming back to the initial point of democratization of data so democratization of data is extremely important in terms of availability to uh, you know 30 years back when internet came in india or where, where, where the whole world it actually changed the way information was democratized. So today also, this age computing will democratize data to the actual users on the ground. That is extremely important. Concluding thoughts, Atul. So, uh, thoughts on, if you could tell, tell me a topic on which I need to. Challenges, what do you see as the immediate challenges? How no, do you no, see? We've been using uh, a combination of edge, on-prem and cloud so far. So I think the biggest challenge is basically articulating a business use case and selling it to the internal, you know, to your leadership team that, you no, know, this makes sense. Because unless you have that business case and you are able to do it and, 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 and that will only result for, for the monies to be on the table and unless you have those budgets allocated. And to have so, you no, know, what is important is, you no, know, you have to run experiments okay and when i say experiments we often believe that no we'll have to call some vendor and carry out experiments uh, what i have learned and what i have practiced here is no you have to make your own team okay maybe they will not be aware of a particular technology like yeah, i give you an example about i uh, talk about chat gpt nobody knew about chat gpt till november 22 okay but now you would find kids doing their homework using chat gpt why so because they put their made their uh, feet wet, they got, got into it, started using it. Uh, they, they didn't go get any formal training, but still they could uh, start doing it. Likewise, these new age technologies, you, know, you have to set some small pilots within your department, try it out, demonstrate it to the users, because unless you can eat and demonstrate to your team, other cross-functional team members that this is how we do it, and of course we then have to scale it up to a different, very different level, production level, that will exude a lot of confidence and that will give a lot of confidence to them also to put their monies on your Absolutely, process. absolutely aligned on that. Unless the IT team is ready uh, to deploy something or is able to show some value to the users, you will not get the money on the table. Well, definitely. And, and, and I just also want to highlight sometimes though we uh, have to also factor that many times the partner ecosystem, that's also a big challenge, okay? Partner ecosystem may promise you the moon that no, we will get you this, we will get you that.
but often times you would find that they would they their team members or they themselves wouldn't I'm have done learning, yeah. and a, even an iota of such an implementation in the past and they might be experimenting along with you so that's a big problem because then you would have put your uh, budgets there and you find yourself being a, a test patient so to say yeah i think we are at risk of getting escorted out but uh, maybe uh, carl uh, another one or two points since i represent Wait. the partner community that 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 hurts that's <laughs> below the belt for uh, large language models when you're looking at ai and and looking at ai models internally nitin anything so i think we heard about the other challenges one challenge in acceptance of edge is which we should not undermine is the people uh, let's say in the manufacturing setup when i spoke of the biggest challenge was not technology because our demand from the technology was minuscule we didn't expect magics to be done uh, partner ecosystem also thankfully we could find some good partners to work but the challenge was people uh, let's say i'm i'm used to tell telling uh, the efficiency of machine to be in 90% or in that range the actual efficiency may not be that uh, because of the paperwork that was done the machine efficiency could be perceived as that uh, above 90% uh, when we use edge and all these things the people would not accept the number to be anything less it will create a huge ripples so managing that part and doing that cultural change is also one piece i just thought i'll highlight so so i i like two challenges actually so one of them is uh, you know the fast change changing technology so so what's happening is that we have to make a decision but the tech is the underlying tech is changing so how do we not do investment throw money where it should not be thrown so that that that's one challenge which i am seriously seeing in the ai chat open ai some of these spaces and the other what atul said is about internal selling actually it's the other side of that also because nowadays users come and they don't come with a problem they come with a solution that i want to use say open ai and then you have to say what's the problem and then whether this is the right way or you just need a simple solution there so that's the other because more of these technologies are becoming common coming on the newspaper it's becoming difficult for the tech folks to you you know what avoid those and keep your balance on one direction on how you want to move forward with yeah, yeah. so as parna said prioritizing and setting those priorities along with the users i believe is the only way to go uh, thank you so much for a very interesting hopefully the audience also found it useful and relevant uh, thank you so much for your participation thank you.